Okay, today I'm talking about space considerations, but I wanted to start off with a small example here. Um, so what you're seeing here are two different floor plans. One is from the early 1900s and one is more recent. You could probably look at it and tell which one is from the early 1900s. If you guessed the one on the left, then you're correct. Now, if you're old enough or you've lived in a home that's old enough, you would notice that this was a common setup where you had a living room and you had a den. Now, still to this day, I don't understand why they had these two separate things. I know that the living room probably had the least amount of living done in it. And the den was a place where you kind of entertained yourself. And the living room was a place where you entertain your guests. And no one went in there. It's a junk-free zone. Everything was pristine. And that was a setup. But if you compare that to the more recent floor plans, they don't have the two different types of rooms that um, are associated with entertaining self versus entertaining guests. And that right there shows the difference in importance between um, floor plan that was done in early 1900s and one that was done 100 years later. You may notice that the floor plan that's done 100 years later is able to capture more bedrooms than the one that was done earlier. And the main reason for that is because what was, again, important back then may not be as important now. So you may suggest that there's a more efficient use of space because you can fit more bedrooms in the same amount of square footage, which these happen to both be about 1,200 uh, square foot floor plans. So you can fit more bedrooms and maybe arguably more entertaining space in this design versus this design. But it really just depends on what is appreciated and valued in the era in which it was designed. This brings up a thought. I wonder how many things we modify in consideration of space. I remember back in college, uh, I definitely came up with some real inventive ways to create space in the dorm rooms. Uh, we stacked desks up and made entire entertainment centers from them. Uh, we've done things with beds that were probably statically indeterminate and unsafe, but it served a purpose for what it is that we desire to use that space for. And I believe that is the case now, not only with floor plans, but also with things that have to deal with other areas of the society, especially in transportation. Here's another way of looking at it. Let's say you were provided this sheet of paper with the four shapes shown. And your task was to rearrange these shapes so that the white space that you see here would be at its maximum. So you want to create or rearrange these shapes so that the, the, the white space that is shown in all of these different locations can be at its maximum availability. I mean, you can look at this from a public standpoint. Uh, they've been given a certain amount of space and they need to maximize that space. So one way of thinking about it is you may say, well, I can rearrange those triangles and I could possibly uh, put the circle inside of the square. I've increased my white space here. Um, so more or less a little bit efficient. Um, or I could do my personal favorite and then just place all of the shapes inside of the box. Now that's thinking inside of the box. Sorry. I couldn't, I couldn't let go of the dad joke. But you get the point. So the idea here is to try and maximize the amount of space that has been provided for us for us to be responsible over it so that the public can use it in the way that's most efficient for the times. Now I received these next set of pictures from the Denver Strategic Transportation Plan and they supplied some very interesting photos. So for instance, here's a picture where you may assume that there is a traffic jam. Um, you may look at uh, these two sides as being parking and then you have two lanes going in one direction or four lanes in all one direction. But regardless of how you see this, there are 
many different vehicles taking up all types of space that is designed and for use of the public. Now, typically, we like to drive in our own vehicles, and if we were to replace those individual vehicles with just the people that were inside those vehicles, this is what it might look like, where each person takes up a certain amount of space that is, again, used or constructed and designed for public use. Now, if you're thinking about this like I am, you wouldn't assume that this is a really good, efficient use of space. Um, with everything that we do, we want to be efficient and effective. And so looking at it from this standpoint, you may think, well, what other options are there? Here are the same number of people that were shown in the previous picture, now compacted and tightly grouped into one location. Now, if you were to compare this picture with the last picture, you would definitely say that this is a more efficient use of space. And where do we get a, a plan or a, um, a way or a vehicle that can tightly compact these many people, uh, this amount of, uh, of individuals into one tightly closed space? Well, that vehicle is called a bus especially or a streetcar or a tram or anything that is used along the roadways that have been designed for the public. What if we place every single person that we saw in that bus and then distribute them in ways that promoted walking or bicycling? Uh, you may say that it's not as an efficient use of space, because now they're more spread out as opposed to being concentrated in one location. However, when you compare it to the vehicles or the individual cars, this is still a much more efficient use of space. So here's a look at that one more time, time side by side. You have the vehicles, the cars, individual cars driven by individual people and the amount of space that that takes up. You take the same group of people and you condense them into one concentrated space, now you have much more room, or much more opportunities to do something else with the space that has been given to us to use appropriately. Maybe you might want to add some bike lanes or some walkable spaces. You can do something in the middle here. But again, the public has given the people and authority, the decision makers, uh, the responsibility of taking that which belongs to the public and using it in an efficient way that's not only efficient for travel, but also good for the environment. And so if you're looking at it from an environmental standpoint, a mixture of everything probably makes sense. Where you can have a bus lane, you can have your bike lanes, and you can have a walkable area so that this one vehicle is using much less space than the number of vehicles with all of, well, with all the vehicles um, driven by one person at a time. But not only that, this one vehicle is emitting less, less pollution in the air than all of these individual vehicles driven by one person. So it's just a different way of thinking. How can we use the space that was provided to us as officials by the public effectively and responsibly so that all can enjoy and still get to their destination in a suitable time. The phrase suitable time is an important phrase because that's really one of the main drawbacks to public transportation. You can't get to where you want to in an easy, comfortable, and suitable time all the time. And you have less control of when and how that happens. And so the comfort of driving your individual vehicle has to be overcome if we're ever going to get this group of folks to commit 
to traveling together on one vehicle. So, if the space taken up by traffic congestion is considered an inefficient use of land, then one could make the space less desirable. Uh, you can make it less desirable by taxing the use of that area. So now, if you wanted to drive your car here, for instance, uh, there will be a tax that you would have to pay. Uh, those can be done in many different forms. It can be tolls or you can just block it for certain individuals. Um, but just making it a little bit more un financially uncomfortable for people to use this area if you don't want uh, individual vehicles traveling in this one location. Another way that you can make that space less desirable for those individual vehicles is that you can make other modes of transportation more attractive. And by attractive, I mean, let's just take this bus, for example. You can make it more convenient, meaning it has more routes, it's more reliable, it gets places faster, meaning it has its own dedicated lanes, so there's not much traffic, or you don't get caught up in as much traffic. You can make it more comfortable. Uh, you can have different features on buses or these different types of uh, transit that exist, um, L trains and, and whatnot. And then last but not least, you can make it more affordable. And some people, believe it or not, have trouble affording uh, transportation. And so therefore, they're relying on public transportation. However, if you charge the amount of money it actually took to operate the public transportation per person, many people will be priced out of being able to access that public transportation. And so to make it more affordable would also make that mode of travel more desirable. And that affordability comes in the form of something called a subsidy. So here's a subsidy example challenge. You have three balls here. One's a bean bag type of ball, has a little weight to it. This ball bounces. Um, not 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 as not as heavy as this and then you have this cotton ball now we're going to assume for the sake of this example that each one of these balls has the same importance and they all need to travel from the edge of the screen to the other side of the screen here okay now we have to make this work no matter what each one of these balls has to travel that location you'll see that it's going to require more effort to make one of these balls travel to the other side than the other. Now, the way that we're going to be transporting these, these balls is by blowing them from this direction that way. And let's do it. Here's the first example. Transporting the cotton ball. Same level of effort. That was easy enough. What if I took the next ball type here? A little bit harder to do. And it started rolling back. Last ball type here. Again, spin bag, a lot heavier. Same amount of effort. Couldn't do it. Didn't even move. So now in the order of easiest to most difficult, we have the balls that I was able to transport from one end of the screen to the other end of the screen. Now again, it was important that each one of them get transported because each, of them, each one of them has the same importance. And by transporting them, we help our uh, goal. Now you may have noticed that if you had the choice, it would be easier for you to transport three cotton balls compared to only one of these or one of these types of balls. And so if I were a private organization and someone told me that I needed to transport all these different types of balls, I would probably focus on the ones that are easiest to transport to a given location. I would neglect these harder balls to transport. So in order for me as a private organization to be convinced to serve these harder 
types of uh, walls here to transport in a different screen, I would need a little bit of help. The amount of effort that it takes me to transport these cotton balls is not as hard and as difficult as the amount of effort it's going to take me to transport this one or this one. So I'll need more resources. I would need help. I would need more funding to do the same job for this ball as I've done for these three. That is called subsidizing. So by subsidizing, I can now spend the same amount of effort and transport all these different types to the location that is desired. So now this brings us to the question, what is a subsidy? Well, many will argue it is a simple payment for a contracted service with a private sector for the public good. Now that means that the greater the private sector involvement in public spaces, uh, would require greater regulation since the direct control between the authority or the owner and the operator is diminished. So if I am now stating that the private company that I hire out as a public entity needs to now transport all three and in order for them to do that and not lose money because this one is a lot harder to transport, I will give them extra funds needed to transport every single one of these types. But that also means because I'm providing the extra funds that I will always also need to uh, regulate how many of these types of balls get transported. Because as a private organization, again, it's a lot easier for me to transport this, waste a lot less um, uh, gas uh, or fuel, whatever is required to push this forward. Uh, so I can still maintain my agreement of providing a certain amount of uh, service to a certain number of folks, but I also need to make sure that I'm providing it to the folks that need it as well. And so that's why subsidies come in, because I would lose money as a private organization if I only focused on the ones that were hardest to transport. So when you look at it from a different view, here is a graph of the volume of output um, for public mass trans transit systems in big urbanized areas. And what's shown here are the fares that are being charged and the operating co cost in order to provide that service. And so you'll notice that the fares that are charged and the actual cost to provide that service to the, to the folks that are using it are not on the same level. And so that difference between those two is what really needs to be subsidized in order to get that service to the mass public. Less populated locations tend to have lower ridership and higher subsidies. So areas that are not high, highly populated uh, tend to need a little bit more help to provide the same service or at least some type of service for the harder to move folks than those that are a lot easier to use. And that's just basically the economies of scale. It's easier to transport many than it is just to transport one, um, especially to remote locations where not everybody may be traveling to the same spot. So that is one thing that needs to be overcome. Now you may be asking why would I care to even try to transport this person or these types of, of balls here when it's a lot easier to, for me to focus here? Where, well, it's uh, another way of looking at the um, economy as a whole. So this person or this type of ball is feeding the economy just as much as this type of ball here. Now you may say, well, not everything's equal, which is correct. But if this person can't work, then how can this person make money? And of course, I'm saying person involved, but you get the idea. So uh, it brings us back to our last topic here. Some stated benefits to subsidizing are to relieve would-be congested on, congestion on the road. Um, air pollution, as we talked about before, 
uh, you will have less uh, vehicles, individual vehicles on the road. So if you can get more people in a concentrated location traveling in the same direction, that one vehicle will emit less pollution than many vehicles of the same number of folks. And then finally, time um, is a benefit to subsidizing um, uh, different types of, of modes of transportation. Uh, the time to transport them, the, the effort to transport them. Um, so all of these things are important and are some of the stated benefits to subsidizing.